it looks like all the signs are pointing to an imminent housing correction or crash, except I think it's going to hit us a little faster than we initially thought. Welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Randy Patrick here putting the realism back in real estate. Today is June 23rd. Hope you are doing well. Lots to talk about today. This will probably be a longer video. Might want to play it on 1.5 speed. Anyway, this video is brought to you by our friends at foreclosure.com. If you hit gethousingdata.com, that's gethousingdata.com. That's my affiliate link. And you can check out all the distressed property listings that are on the site here. There's even a seven-day free trial. Basically, everything I'm talking about now, this website becomes very important because it shows you what's going on in your neighborhood, your backyard, etc. with respect to all the pre-foreclosures, short sales, tax deeds, probates, etc. You want to check out this site, gethousingdata.com. All right, guys. So as I mentioned, things are happening at breakneck speed these days. And as I said, all signs are pointing to a housing correction or crash. Now, you know, as I always mentioned, it's not one thing that pushes us over the edge. It's typically a number of things that are happening at the same time. Just like the last, you know, the Great Recession, um, it looks like it's happening again here. What do we got going on? Well, obviously, everybody knows high mortgage rates, they keep going up, all right? So that's obvious. That's causing chaos in the marketplace. That's, you know, basically, you know, crippling buyers. It's, it's, you know, moving interest rates or payments about, you know, 50% more than they were, you know, a few months ago. So it's having an impact on the market. We'll see, see how that plays out. The Fed is actually telling us that they will reset the market. They're basically saying everything is out of control and we're not going to go back to quantitative easing until we get a handle on these home prices. So the Fed is actually telling us that they want to reset the market. And as I mentioned in my last video, I mean, that that's what the, what's going forward. And that's why, they're, you know, the, uh, the interest rates are going up. But, you know, is reset just a more polite word uh, instead of saying crash or correct, maybe? So that's what we have to deal with here. Uh, obviously, in, there's an increasing volume of homes that are for sale in the marketplace right now. In my local area here, the greater Tampa area, the past couple of months, I've seen a 100% increase in listings, which is kind of interesting. We're also starting to see an increase in list price reductions. According to Redfin, the other day, they said that at least 20% of the listings out there across the board are having price reductions. Mortgage applications are down. They've been down for X number of weeks on both the refinance and purchase volume side. Clearly, that's, that's you know that comes you know happens with you know, the mortgage rate increase effect. New home sales are down. So the lent, the builders are going well. We're seeing a slowdown in every aspect of the new home uh, you know market. So that's concerning. And of course, because we have all this buyer sentiment, it's at its lowest right now. It's been low for a while. It's like every month it just gets worse and worse. Now, material prices, very high. We've had a past couple of years of high lumber prices, you know, just shortages, etc. So it's very difficult for the you know, do-it-yourself market, Home Depot, Lowe's, the whole bit. Builders, uh, smaller builders are having a heck of a time, you know, getting product to, to finish their houses, etc. And this is having an, an impact all over the place. Uh, investor flipper profit declining. So basically, if you buy and sell a home and you buy and remodel a home to flip it, uh, your profit margin is going down for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, prices are higher uh, to, to purchase. Two, now we're seeing increase in, in interest rates on money you're going to need or, or get loans to, to do this type of work. And also uh, profit going down because of the, um, you know, the, the cost of materials now. So things are changing the marketplace. And this really points to some changes that we're going to see very shortly. Uh, still more stuff happening in our market to cause a correction or crash. Uh, increase in job losses and claims. And we're going to go through all these points in a second here, substantiate it. Obviously, no more stimulus money, no no unemployment or stimulus money coming in these days. So um, that's the way it goes. Uh, inflation, we all know about inflation. It's at its you know, peak for the how many past years, 40 years or something. <clears throat> we do have mortgage delinquencies, though they're not spoken of for whatever reason. We do have forbearance that people still have forbearance. We do have loan modification issues and people that are rolling out of forbearance in these loan mod programs. We do have an increase in foreclosure fines and activity. So it's actually happening. But the distressed property is not on the market right now because we're just at the starting point of all that. So it hasn't had a chance to affect the market or bring uh, much needed volume in or price points down. But it will happen soon. High rent prices. So, you know, typically, you know, when you have, you know, high uh, purchase prices, if rent prices are, are reasonable, 
then you know buyers who can't buy or de decline to buy or decide not to can hop to the rental market and, st and still survive. Well, guess what? It's not working that way anymore. If you can't buy because the prices are so high and with higher interest rates you're getting priced out, well, guess what? Rent prices the past year have, have caught up. They've been almost 20% year over year uh, increase across the board. So now that's that's complicating matters for everybody, whether you're buying or renting. You know, basically, accommodation is at a peak. This, this depends on what you need, right? Um, I see the feet on the street, which I call the wholesale market. Um, I see uh, this past week, I saw a, a number of properties hit that I haven't seen before. And there seems to be a little bit of a flurry going on. So it's like people are trying to move stuff. And I'm also seeing price decreases. So again, I always say the feet on the street, see the market and react to the market you know, first. And then it kind of plays out uh, along retail and other components of the real estate industry. And also, realtor count is at an all-time high. And what do I mean by that? Well, in an appreciating market, everybody goes, maybe I should get my real estate license. And that way I could, you know, earn commissions and buy and sell or do whatever, you know, because everybody else is making money. So, you know, just like the last housing crisis, when there is a surge, um, you know, in, in, in activity in the real estate side, when prices go up dramatically, the realtor count goes up and just like the last housing crisis. So we're at like something about like 1.5 for one point about 1.565 million realtors. Now realize that realtor means that you subscribe to or you're a member of NAR, National Association of Realtors, so you're paying an annual dues to them. Uh, but you can also be a real estate agent and not subscribe to to um, National Association of Realtors, NAR. So if, if there's about 1.565 um, realtors out there, I think they're saying the total number of real estate agents is about 2 million. Okay, so think about that. You've got basically, you know, almost a two to one realtor or a real estate agent uh, to active property listing ratio out there. Okay, double the agents. The there's more. There's two two agents for every listing. Basically, there you go. So something tells me that when things play out, we're going to lose a lot of real estate agents out there. So that you know are reasons that are legit. And this is the stuff that ex this is exactly what happened. In the last housing crisis as well too so we have to take all these things into consideration and you know you just can't turn your head and go you know what you know stuff is not going to happen you know this is these are not just two signs we're talking you know what i got you know double you know we're talking 15 reasons here um that we're that are pointing to the reason why we're going to have a, have a housing correction or crash it's simple as that okay so let's take a look at the next slide here and I'm actually going to um, do what I like to do, which typically is um, uh, debunk all the naysayers. So, of course, when you look at, you know, and also just this as a, as a factor, of course, we've had mainstream media, as you know, which I, I'm not a fan of, talking about how great the housing market is the past couple of years, nothing to worry about. So we have always that. That's almost like an underlying thing that's always there. OK, so something is just a given now. And of course, you know, a lot of people who are still pro-housing and get and please realize that I'm not anti-housing. As a matter of fact, I'm the opposite. I'm pro-housing, but pro-cheaper housing. So you can buy your property and you can be happy and you can invest and you can make money. You can get your first home. I mean, that's what we all want to have happen. OK, we just don't want this you know, upcoming wealth transfer to, to basically cream the industry. All right. Simple as that. Now, but it's different this time. So every person who is the pro, everything's great in the industry is, is going to talk about why it's different this time. Well, of course, they, this, the, there's the three or four things they go to. We'll debunk them right now. Better borrowers, better loans, better higher credit scores, better loans. We're not going to have the same you know, stuff we had back in the day. Well, guess what? We have FHA. FHA is today's subprime. FHA allows for lower credit scores, higher debt to income ratio, uh, lower down payment. So guess what? That's problematic for some buyers. And of course, the segment, the, the, the highest delinquency group segment is FHA buyers. It just proves that that's almost like today's subprime. All right, and we also have uh, other loans that are out there. We have all these, you know, uh, you know, non-QM loans, and we also have arms. So, you know, adjustable rate mortgages are actually coming back. They've been back for the past couple of years. They just don't get the play in the industry, uh, but people are using them right now, and they're going to use them more now that interest rates are higher. Okay, so realize that that's that. You know, we we have those issues that are coming up with that supply and demand. So basically, what the, everyone says is the fact because of low inventory. There's no supply. Demand will always outpace. It will push prices up. Things are not going to crash. Well, you know what? That may, may that might be okay for uh, as we got to the point where we're at now. But now people are tired. They're over it the whole bit. Look, for example, at the home builders. 
home builders have about you know nine months of supply on their hands right now. So if all these people want to buy homes and there's nine months supply on the builder side, why aren't they selling their homes? Hmm, it's because of price point. Oh, it's because of interest rates. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, that's the changes they've made over the, you know, they can't guarantee you prices won't change once you, you know, lock in uh, on a contract because of materials. So guess what? We're seeing big supplies now at the builder level, new home builder level. And um, that, so that really kind of, I think, blows that, you know, um, we'll call it, you know, it's different this time theory out of there. Um, the foreclosure stuff. So, of course, this is a highly debatable topic. Nobody seems to know the exact number of who's in distress. But the point, though, is that if you're facing foreclosure, hey, don't worry why you're simply going to sell. Why you've got all this equity, sell your home, walk away with your equity, off you go. Well, guess what? As I mentioned, the distress volume is not factored. So, you know, they think there's just one every so often amount of people, you know, there's a you know, foreclosure here, foreclosure there, they can sell, not a big issue. There's more there than meets the eye. There's more in the shadow inventory that we're not realizing or that they're not realizing at this point in time, okay? So the distress volume is not factored. Equity gets compressed very quickly. What I mean by that is the fact that, you know, these people like the mainstream media are looking at, you know, the, the trillions in equity versus the loan balance that they're pulling upon when you bought your property and, and they're making a calculation of this equity. Well, they don't know how many months you haven't paid. They don't know what's been chipping away at your at your home as far as non-payments, escrows, taxes, insurance, whatever, fees, admin costs, whatever. That's it's actually compressing your equity. It's also under the assumption that if you're going to sell, you're going to put it on the MLS. You're going to have you know realtor commissions, closing costs, tax prorations. That's going to chip into your equity when you close. And also, if you want the premium money, you better have a premium property. What I mean by that is you got to have a new roof. You're going to have to have new AC systems. You better have a, a remodeled kitchen and bathrooms and you know a, a nicely done house and the whole bit. So all these things come into factor on the premium big you know big equity trillions of equity money you want to get your hands on if you're selling. If you don't have that, well, remember as I always say, you know, uh, equity is not equal to cash flow. So people who are facing foreclosure have a cash flow conundrum. That's what they're facing right now. So guess what? They're not going to have that money to fix a roof to, or new roof, to, to put a new AC in, to redo um, carpets and paint and, and hardwood floors and the bathrooms and, and, and the kitchen. So, you know, all those great things that you see on, you know, unique homes and realtor.com and all those great stuff, these properties that are going for, for high-end money uh, or top dollar, well, you're not going to get that from, from the foreclosure property. So that's kind of a myth that we're debunking right now. And the last one that I really want to get to is the fact that speculation, okay, back in the last housing crisis, what did we have? Rampant speculation. Why? Investors were buying, people were buying and trying to resell, trying to make a quick buck. Well, guess what? That actually hasn't gone away. Do you not think there are more investors now in the marketplace than there were back in 2006 and 7? There's a heck of a lot more, okay? And they're even more well-funded. And a lot of these investors are actually overbuying at the foreclosure auction or even on the street because they're long-term hold buyers and their hedge funds are real estate investment trusts. They're actually paying a premium because rent prices are up. So they're actually speculating. And I can tell you that retail buyers are speculators, or at least they were the past couple of years, because we would hear over you know, 2019, 20, 21 about bidding wars and you know all these you know news reports about a home in Dallas goes up and there's a hundred people in an open house and somebody's selling their house some you know somewhere else in North Carolina and they've got 40 offers in one hour and you know and now it's a highest and best bidding war well and the, and you know the, the numbers are going for 50k 100k 200k over list price well hmm tell me that's not speculation if the list price is X how do you know it's not going to appraise for that right? How do you know you're going to have to bring money and that's not going to be covered by your loan? So retail buyers in today's market, or at least until now, we'll see how it plays out. Retail buyers, we're speculating. The minute you get into a bidding war and you play that game, you are speculating. So when they say there's no speculation, just again, dismiss that. That's the biggest crock out there. So this is what's happening in the marketplace or what has happened. And if you don't think it's going to lead to some change you know, I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you guys. All right. Uh, and it's going to happen a lot faster than I think we all predicted. Reason being because the Fed basically said we, we need a reset. We want this to start happening faster. And I, and I actually didn't read it all today, but I did see something about when they're planning their QE, which, you know, is sometime in 2023, which means things are going to compress 
and change and, and crash out faster uh, than I think we all were anticipating, all right? Here's to support this. Initial jobless claims at five-month highs as layoffs accelerate. So, yeah, maybe we have 7 million available jobs out there, but people are still getting laid off, okay? Um, JP Morgan fires hundreds of mortgage bankers as housing market breaks. So this is what I also call forefront of information. When the lenders are going, we don't see the business here, and we don't predict the business to, to, to be happening for quite some time, they lay off and they fire. Um, basically, uh, banks decide that more than a thousand workers will be affected by the flood on housing, uh, with roughly half fire, half moved to other areas, uh, divisions of the bank. All right, so that's going on right now. Um, clearly, um, we also saw this with respect to, uh, you know, well, we're stunning 6.13, you know, interest rate right now. Basically, we're seeing, um, you know, Wells Fargo uh, did some stuff as well too. Uh, Compass and Redfin announced plans to trim their workforces. In the U.S. cooling U.S. housing market, so we're gonna and and a lot of other regional lenders have trimmed or have announced that. So it's not just these big guys; it's happening all over the board, all across the U.S. Everybody, okay? So when the real estate industry itself is in a you know employment contraction, you know that there's problems coming down the down the path for sure. All right, uh, and then the funny thing here is that listen, is real estate following crypto and stocks to a bloodbath? following Redfin and Compass layoffs. So we, we also have stock performances. So of course, stock markets going down, um, all these, you know, real estate stocks, you know, Open Doors, Zillow's, whatever, their stocks are hurting, all right? Redfin stock is down. So a lot of these real estate quasi tech companies that are out there, um, they're hurting because a lot of their future in from, uh, future revenue or, or you know, forward look, looking revenue is based on house price appreciation. These, uh, still increasing or maintaining status quo, and they're not going to have that now. So if you bought a bunch of properties like Zillow did back in the, you know last year or two years ago to build your business and you can't sell them, what are you going to do, right? You're going to take a loss on that and then sell them at a discount. So that's that's going to hurt bottom lines for all these companies. It's going to hurt stock prices. So the point though is that you know um, you know real estate typically, and I said this other day with some article, I forget where it was, but it was an, an uh, I think it was a Moody's guy, but basically said real estate typically is the last thing stocks crypto whatever you know last kind of asset to to get pulled down to, to lose value it sort of i guess holds for a while but that's kind of the last little piece of the puzzle when things start changing so that's why we expect it's going to happen now to make matters worse okay redfin shareholders approve executive bonuses hey great i'm an executive i get my my big bonuses um, same day the company announced the major layoff. So if that's not insult to injury, I don't know what really is. All right. Hey, foreclosure starts. So you know what? Once again, we're going to play with some of the mainstream media, how they talk about stuff here. Foreclosure filings inched up last month. But guess what? Um, you know, it's climbing towards pre-pandemic levels. Um, foreclosure starts outnumbered completions by nearly tenfold in May. So what we're seeing is the fact that now all these starts are increasing. So starts are... Notice of foreclosure filing, Liz pendants in the judicial states, or notice of default in the non-judicial states, right? U.S. foreclosure activity increases slightly in May. So it increased slightly. This is, again, the play on the words here. It increased slightly in May. From April to May, it was a 1% increase, okay, but up 185% from a year ago. So, okay, let's start to qualify that now. So we're, we're pretty much status on the monthly. We, we're jumping big time on the year over year, all right? New, Illinois, New Jersey, Delaware had the highest foreclosure um, rates, basically. And obviously, um, you know, inflation at a 41-year high. Uh, we're going to see if we're not going to, maybe we'll see some, some increase in foreclosure activity as time goes on. I would expect that. Florida, California, and Texas had the greatest number of foreclosure starts. So basically, lenders started the foreclosure process. Uh, for properties in May was down 1% from last month, but up 274% from a year ago. So the foreclosure starts are up big time, and that's what we're concerned about. Okay, the back, you know, we're not going to have backlog or or some of the activity because we didn't have much starts over the past couple of years. Now we're going to see these starts picking up big time. All right, states that had the greatest number of foreclosure starts in May: Florida, number one; California, number two; Texas, number three; Illinois, number four; Ohio, number five. Doesn't surprise me. These are the states that typically have these type of numbers. You know, um, areas like Miami up 81%, Washington, D.C. up 60%, 
Birmingham up 56%, Cincinnati up 54%, Jacksonville, Florida up 54%. So, you know, as I said, you know, I take a look at the things that are going to push us over the edge. Well, it's stuff like this. We're not talking 5% increase, you know, 10%, 20%. We're talking 50%, 60%, 81%. So, yeah, when we had a slow year because of, you know, moratoriums and things, things like that, I get it. But now things are popping up and we're seeing bigger numbers. And that's going to happen for the next year or so, year or two for sure. Um, you know, we're looking at three to four years of this, right? Uh, zip codes are the highest foreclosure rates. Typically, look, we've got a lot in Ohio, Cleveland, Cleveland, Chicago, Illinois, Cleveland, Illinois, 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 Amityville, New York, Dalton, Illinois. So, you know, it's kind of like these are obviously areas where we have some depressed economic situations. Not surprising, though, it seems to be that way every every um, month. Now, also, guess what? We're looking at areas that have um, vulnerable housing markets. So this is kind of interesting. So basically, Adam is saying they have a special housing risk report spotlighting on county level markets around the U.S. that are more or less vulnerable to declines based on home affordability, unemployment, and other measures in the first quarter. Looks like that New Jersey, Illinois, and inland California had the highest concentrations of, of most at-risk markets, biggest clusters in the New York City and Chicago areas. Uh, most of the southern states were less exposed. All right, so again, we're talking about some, some big areas here. Um, 32 of the 50 U.S. counties most vulnerable. Um, okay, so we're looking at Chicago, New York, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Delaware, and California. Eight of them in Chicago. Uh, we have um, six in New York City metro area, three in Philadelphia, uh, and we have a couple in New Jersey, three in the Cleveland area, and we have... Um, um, Sussex County, and which is uh, Delaware as well, too. Other states that had issues, California had 10 counties. And again, all the inland stuff around Sacramento, Stockton, Fresno area, um, you know, the, uh, Modesto area, Bakersfield. You had some stuff in the Maryland area, of course, Washington, uh, Baltimore area, etc. So, you know, what's playing out here is the fact that, you know, because of a lot of other reasons, economic reasons, demographics, whatever, uh, you know, industry, uh, income, etc., um, we're seeing other locations are going to have some some issues now. Counties with uh, at most risk have higher levels of unaffordable housing, underwater mortgages, foreclosures, and unemployment. So it's kind of like your quadruple, you know, hit there, right? Uh, it's a domino effect. A lot of things are going on at once and to have some problems. But I, I know that I, this is interesting because it said at least 10% of residential mortgages were underwater in the first quarter of 2022 in 22 of the, of the 50 most at-risk counties, all right? Nationwide, 6.5% of mortgages fell in that category. Okay, so guess what? You know, 6.5% of all mortgages are underwater. What does underwater mean? Well, that means that, you know, the, your house mortgage uh, balance is actually greater than what your house is worth. So you are technically underwater. So that means if you were to sell your house today, you'd actually, you wouldn't be making money at closing, you have to bring money to closing to pay off your loan balance, right? So 6.5% of mortgages fell in that category. Interesting that this information came out because a lot of times they talk about, every so often, Adam will do a quarterly equity report and they'll talk about the seriously underwater level, which is about 25 to 3%. Now they've just shown their hand and told us that the nationwide, just the underwater mortgages, so again, seriously underwater, which they tell us, you know, 25 3% is 25%. Uh, you know, greater loan balance than, than it's worth. Um, just underwater is just one percent above. That's worse. Okay, so we're looking at six point five percent of all mortgages fall into that category. Interesting to know. All right, so that's that's something you know you got to think about here. Uh, oh, by the way, if you have not subscribed to my channel and you appreciate the information I provide, if you could hit that subscribe button, I really appreciate that. And secondly, if guess what. Um, you think you've subscribed and you're not getting notifications, etc. Please resubscribe or, or, or just reaffirm your subscription because I lose subscribers every day. It's just the, what I deal with on this channel. So again, I appreciate um, you know what you guys are doing here. All right, thank you. So let's go on here. Okay, um, as I also mentioned the other day, so I am looking for additional real estate agents, but I need them primarily in the Florida area. Okay, I should have qualified that. Uh, last time, I got people calling me from, you know, messaging me from California or different parts of the world. I'm looking for Florida people right now. Do I have plans to expand in the future? Yes, I do to other states as the housing crash correction kind of plays out. 
I have specific areas I'd like to go to. Those will be named in the future. All right, also, short sale program is back for a limited time. Why? Because you need it, and it's got to happen because stuff is going on right now. Um, I'm moving towards a Mondo Fabulous foreclosure, uh, all-in you know, foreclosure fortune program, which will include the short sale program. So if you get into my program now, you're going to have all the benefits of the future stuff. Um, I'll just upgrade you when, when it's time. So get into this program now because, it, like I'm telling you, Stuff's happening out there. This is the time to get it before the masses get into all these properties. Also, if you are in um, the local Tampa Bay area, my Tampa Real Estate Investment Club, find me on meetup.com, go to the group section, type in my Tampa Real Estate Investment Club, and you'll see my stuff there. Um, I have typically uh, meetings about twice a month, where and it's free. Just get together. We have topics that are interesting, whether it's foreclosure, short sales, or whether it's crypto and how that affects the um, real estate market. We do a little bit of everything here. So that's stuff for the future, guys. But again, that's the page on Meetup. So just join the group and you'll be uh, done, you'll get information uh, with respect to when stuff is happening in the marketplace here. Okay. Um, again, here's we got more information. Housing markets labeled high risk of home price uh, drop just spiked 73%. So basically, um, you know, they're talking about, you know, we're staring down at the sharpest decline in housing activity since 2006. Now, housing activity doesn't necessarily mean price decline. It just means activity. It's slowing down here, right? But what they're saying here is the fact that, you know, CoreLogic found that, you know, um, this past month that, you know, 45 mark markets had a greater than 50% chance of seeing local home prices decline over the next 12 months. Um, uh, compared to last month when they said that, it's up 73%. That's a 73% jump. So um, basically, uh, you know, all these groups, all these data companies, mortgage companies, whatever, are starting to say, hey, we're starting to see some problems here. Expectations are prices will jump. And you know what? As I've said before, this is the summer selling season right now. We'll see how it plays out with these high rates. And, you know, I think this will be a big determination as to how fast things will fall. Uh, once we see what happens at the end of July here, guys. All right. Um, this basically, we have how CoreLogic rates America's largest regional housing markets. So um, red is overvalued. Purple uh, is normal. And the kind of uh, turquoisey blue is undervalued. So what dominates our, um, our map here? It's red. So basically, two-thirds of the nation's housing markets are overvalued relative to underlying fundamentals. So again, I don't create those fundamentals. Those are fundamentals that are typically done by the economists and analysts. And, and so we've got two thirds of our housing market across the country is overvalued. Whether that you know sparks a change or not remains to be seen. But at least you know you're not basically um, you know thinking you're living in a twilight zone here. And this is something I thought was interesting. Okay, uh, you know when I go back to the whole forbearance, foreclosure stuff, and equity and all that. And and listen, lenders will work with homeowners, and of course they don't want them to go to foreclosure, and they're going to try what they can to implement programs and things like that. But remember, when all this stuff was announced a couple years ago when the pandemic came through and, oh, wow, forbearance, et cetera, it was announced by the White House, by the government at the time, and, you know, that, that forbearance was an option. There were no guarantees. Um, there, was no, there was no um, plans in place. There were no stop gaps. It basically was, hey, you know, use it if you need it. Um, but they didn't really tell you to understand the program. So this is a, a little example here, and I've, I haven't shown this for a while because I just keep forgetting to, but it's interesting because we're seeing more and more people who went into forbearance and thought everything was going to be okay, and when they came you know, off of forbearance, um, you know, basically you know, they were told that um, regular payments would be added to the end of the loan, uh, but you know, again, but they're now saying um, you know, he, they owe money. So in other words, you know, all this sort of shell game of where we're putting the payments Oh, I didn't really mention that, or we weren't clear on that. And hey, listen, you're you're done your forbearance now. Please give us the 12 months worth of payments. Oh, that's a problem. Oh, we don't have the money for that. Oh, that's a problem. You see, so this is where you know the stuff that we hear, and this happened last housing crisis too. Government comes late to the party with programs or solutions. When they do come to the party with those solutions, the solutions basically can assist a small percentage of people. Most people um, just hear what they want to hear, listen to the news, or hear the, or read the headlines. They don't engage properly, understand what their situations are. 
So what will happen, you know, so all these people in forbearance and, you know, the counts look good because people, yeah, because you end your forbearance program, you're done your forbearance program, your, your peg count, you're over. But whether you fall into the loan modification category or whether they refinance you or whether you, and again, there's an article that happened a while ago, a few months ago that basically said, you know, 70 some odd percent of people in loan mods aren't even paying. You see, so that's why the delinquency for forbearance, foreclosure numbers are pretty vague and pretty confusing. In the end, I know from past experience that more people will be in, you know, having difficulty and, and find themselves in the foreclosure bucket than they expected. All right, simple as that. And as far as the volume is concerned, it's said 3 million to 10 million, everything in between, that's the numbers that have been bantered about. Um, I'm thinking, you know, as I said, seven and a half to eight, somewhere in that range. I think there'll be more people affected by this than we're being led to believe. Simple as that. All right. So that's the scoop for today. A little bit longer. Normally, I'm under 30 minutes the past few weeks, but this was a big one today. So, yeah. So if you go back to the start of the, of the video, there's a lot of stuff going on in our real estate market that basically is saying, you know, crash correction, correction, crash, whatever, however you want to play it, whatever you want to call it. You know, this, all this stuff happened last time through. Why is it different this time? You've heard what's different. I've given you the reasons why it's not different. And, and they're just trying to, to basically don't look over here at all the good stuff, although the bad stuff, look over here and just listen to what we say and take it with a grain of salt. All right, guys, thank you very much for the views, likes, comments. Please share the video with your family and friends. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. And we'll look forward to speaking with you early next week. Take care.